15 minute or less lecture series anatomy and physiology chapter 7 skeletal system part 2 we will now talk about the bones of the axial skeleton that lie along the midline of the body first off is the skull the skull forms many important cavities the cranial cavity that houses the brain the two orbits for the eyes the oral cavity for the digestive system the nasal cavity for the respiratory system and attached to the nasal cavity are the various sinuses found in bones the frontal sinuses the ethmoid sinuses the maxillary sinuses and the sphenoidal sinuses out of the 22 bones of the skull eight of them are cranial bones called so because they help form the cranial cavity they include the frontal bone the two parietal bones the two temporal bones the one occipital bone the one sphenoid bone and the one ethmoid bone some of the cranial bones, all cranial bones, all skull bones come together to form fibrous joints called sutures. You'll have to learn the names of five of them. There is the coronal suture between the frontal bone and two parietal bones, the sagittal suture between the two parietal bones, the landoid suture between the parietal bones and the occipital bone, and the right and left squamous sutures between the temporal bone and the parietal bone. First bone up is the frontal bone. The frontal bone possesses the frontal sinuses, helps form the coronal suture, helps form the uh, anterior portion of the cranial cavity, the superior uh, roof of the orbits, and of the nasal cavity. Then the parietal bones, one, two of them, they help form all of the major sutures that we have to learn the names for, and also help to form the superior portion of the cranial cavity. Then the temporal bone, these are lateral bones help form the squamous suture. They also help to form the lateral sides and floor of the cranial cavity and house the inner structures of the ear. Some special structures of the temporal bone include the external acoustic meatus, which forms the ear canal, this rough structure called the mastoid process, this pointier structure called the styloid process, this uh, little depression called the mandibular fossa, which helps form the only movable joint in the skull, and then this little arm sticking out called the zygomatic process that connects to the zygomatic bone. Then we have the occipital bone, the posterior and inferior bone of the skull. It helps form the floor of the cranial cavity, helps form the landoid suture, and also articulates with the vertebral column. It has this hole called the foramen magnum that the spinal cord passes through. It also has these two smooth, rounded structures called the occipital condyles. These form a joint with the first vertebra of the vertebral column. Then we have the sphenoid bone, a funny shaped bone that looks kind of like a butterfly or a bat. It helps form the floors of the cranial cavity. It helps to form the posterior wall of the orbit, helps to form much of the nasal cavity, possesses the sphenoidal sinuses, and articulates with all of the other cranial bones, all of them. Looking down, if we move the top of the skull, we can see the sphenoid bone in pink here, or a lateral view, we can see the sphenoid bone here. This depression here is called the cella tersica. It houses the pituitary gland. Moving on to the ethmoid bone, more of a boxy shaped bone, very tissue thin because it has many, many ethmoidal sinuses within it. It helps to form portions of the cranial cavity. It helps to form the orbits the medial walls of the orbits that helps form the nasal cavity and the nasal septum, that wall that uh, separates our nasal cavity into a right and left side. Taking a view of the skull by taking the top and looking off and looking down, we see this pointy bit of the ethmoid bone called the crystagali. Here it is, side view. And the tissue are surrounding it with many holes in it called the cribiform plate. We also see here projecting downward is the perpendicular plate. It helps form the nasal septum. So here is the nasal septum. Part of its perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. It articulates with the vomer, triangular bone, and also the septal cartilage. These three structures form the nasal septum. Uh, back when we were an infant and were born, it turns out our heads were a little soft. This is because the sutures weren't completely formed. The bones had not completely ossified, and therefore there were these soft tissue areas referred to as fontanelles. Skull has 14 facial bones, the two zygomatic bones, the cheek, the two maxillary bones, the two lacrimal bones, the two nasal bones, the uh, vomer, the two inferior nasal conchi, and the palatine bones, can't see, and the mandible. 
the lacrimal bones help to form the medial wall of the orbits and also form little ducts that lead into the nasal cavity. These ducts will carry tear fluid from the orbit down into the nasal cavity. The lacrimal bone also forms part of the nasal cavity. The nasal bones shown here help to form the bridge of the nose where your glasses may rest and also part of the uh, roof of the nasal cavity. The zygomatic bones are the cheekbones. They help to form the lateral walls and floor of the orbits. The vomer, this triangular bone, helps to form the nasal septum. These two lateral bones of the nasal cavity are called the inferior nasal conchi. And then if you take an inferior view of the skull, you can see these two bones, the two palatine bones. They help to form the posterior portion of the hard palate, the roof of the mouth, which means they also help to form the floor of the nasal cavity. Here is the two maxilla bones. They help to form uh, the lateral walls of the nasal cavity, the floor of the orbits. They also hold the teeth. So they make up the upper jaw, holding the upper teeth. Um, with an inferior view, you can see that they have an area called the palatine process. The palatine process forms a joint with the palatine bone. And together, they form the hard palate. The maxilla forms the anterior portion of the hard palate the roof of the mouth or the floor of the nasal cavity. The mandible. The mandible is the only movable bone of the skull and it also holds the lower teeth, so it's the lower jaw bone. The rounded portion of the mandible that fits into this depression in the temporal bone is called the mandibular condyle. Together they form the only movable joint, the temporal mandibular joint of the skull. Now technically there's a right and left one. Hyoid bone is found in the throat area. It is a U-shaped bone that forms the attachment site for many, many muscles, including muscles of the tongue and larynx, and is often viewed as the superior portion of the larynx. It does not form a joint with any other bone. Then we have the vertebral column. Vertebral column helps to support the head and trunk, protects the spinal cord, provides some cushioning if you sit down hard, and gives us part of our posture. There are uh, seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, five lumbar vertebrae, the sacrum and the coccyx that all form the vertebral column. Uh, if you look closely at the vertebra as they come together, there is a cartilaginous joint made of fibrocartilage that attach to neighboring vertebra. Also, when the two vertebrae come together, you form the intervertebral foramen on the lateral sides that allow spinal nerves to pass through. Uh, the vertebral column also gives a curvature to our back. It has the cervical curvature pointing anteriorly, thoracic curvature pointing posteriorly, lumbar curvature pointing anteriorly, and sacral curvature pointing posteriorly. Um, some issues that can occur is an exaggeration of the curvature of the vertebral column, such as kyphosis, an exaggeration of the thoracic curvature, also called the hunchback, pretty common in elderly folks. Lordosis or swayed back, which is an exaggeration of the lumbar curvature, can be found in pregnant women, but can be found in anybody and may make them look pregnant as it pushes their abdominal organs anteriorly. And finally, scoliosis, which is an abnormal lateral curvature to the vertebral column. Every vertebra almost has a large body, which is mostly bone tissue. It has two processes sticking out laterally called the transverse processes. It has the spinous process sticking out posteriorly. There's two superior articulating processes pointing up to articulate with the bone above them, two inferior articulating processes pointing down to articulate with the bone below them, and this hole called the vertebral foramen where the spinal cord passes through. The cervical vertebra, the seven cervical vertebra, have a few special features. They all have these holes in their transverse uh, processes called transverse foramen that allow blood vessels to pass through. Also, many of them have two points to their spinous process called the bifid spinous process. Atlas, the first cervical vertebra, articulates with the occipital condyles, forming joints that allow us to nod yes. The axis, the second cervical vertebra, has this process that sticks up called the bends. It articulates with the atlas to allow us to form a joint that lets us nod our head no. So here is the bends of the axis articulating with the atlas to form a pivot joint. Thoracic vertebra have extra facets where they articulate with the ribs, both on their transverse process 
and on their body. So as you can see here, one rib will articulate at the transverse process at the body of one and body of one rib, as well as the body of a second rib. Uh, sorry, uh, one vertebra as well as a second vertebra. So one rib articulates with at three places with two different vertebra. Uh, lumbar vertebra are just big. So here's how you can tell the difference between the three types of vertebra. The sacrum is a fusion of about five vertebrae. It has the superior articulating process that articulates with the last of the lumbar vertebrae. And below that is the coccyx or tailbone, a fusion of four vertebrae. Thoracic cage helps form a thoracic cavity that protects many organs in the thoracic cavity. It plays a role in breathing because it can stretch a little bit and also supports the pectoral girdle. The sternum is the breastbone, comes in three parts, the superior manubrium, the middle body, and the inferior xiphoid process. The ribs, there are 12 pairs of ribs, many of them connected directly or indirectly to the sternum via the costal cartilage, basically forming a joint via the costal cartilage, which is hyaline cartilage. The ribs come in three categories. You have the true ribs, which are the ribs pairs one through seven, which are attached directly to the sternum. You have the false ribs, eight through 12, that either articulate to the costal cartilage of rib seven or don't articulate with the sternum at all. And then the last two, 11 and ribs 11 and 12, are called floating ribs because they do not attach to the sternum. There are a variety of joints. There are fibrous joints held together by joint connective tissue that are basically immovable. Example is the sutures in the skull. There are cartilaginous joints where bones are attached by a piece of cartilage, either hyaline cartilage or fibrocartilage. They are mostly immovable, but they can move a little bit. This includes the intervertebral discs between the vertebra. And then synovial joints, pretty much all the other joints. These joints are very movable, have lots of movement ability. They have a joint capsule that is formed, which houses the joint cavity filled with synovial fluid. Um, and within the joint cavity is also the articular cartilage at the smooth ends of the bones. Other structures that may or but don't have to be found in synovial joints include menisci. Meniscus is a piece of fibrocartilage that helps to provide cushion and align bones in a joint, such as the knee joint, as well as bursae. These are food-filled sacs that are formed around, found around a joint to help reduce friction. There are different types of synovial joints based on movement. You have the uh, ball and socket joint where a socket-like head fits into a deep, I mean a rounded head, ball-like head fits into a deep socket. These are multi-axial, allowing for many, many kinds of movements. There is the condylar joint, where a slightly less impressive rounded structure fits into a slightly less impressive um, depression. They are also multi-axial, but don't allow for quite as many movements. There's the plane joints. Planes are when two flat uh, bones come together to form a joint. They can move some, sort of biaxial, by twisting or sliding. There's the hinge joint. The hinge joint, again, a rounded bone fitting into a uh, curved structure. However, these hinge joints are uniaxial, only allow for one kind of movement. The pivot joint is where you have one bone moving around a portion of a second bone. This is only allows for rotational movement and is also uniaxial. And then you have the saddle joint where a rounded joint fits into another rounded joint. It's kind of like a legs going around a saddle. And these joints are biaxial. Arthritis is a terrible disorder of the joints caused by things like Lyme disease and infection, by chronic wear and degeneration, uh, known as osteoarthritis, or by an autoimmune disorder, the immune system attacking the structures of synovial joints, and this is known as rheumatoid arthritis. Movements. We can have a lateral flexion of the vertebral column moving to the sides. We can have flexion and extension at many joints, including the knee. We can have abduction, abduction, moving away or toward the midline, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion of the foot, only the foot, circumduction, a circular movement. We can have medial rotation and lateral rotation at the ball and socket joints, supination, pronation, where the hand moves to face anteriorly or posteriorly. Uh, in the feet, we can also have inversion and eversion. With the jaw, we can project the jaw or retract it, pull it back. We can also elevate our shoulders or depress our shoulders. This is moving the pectoral girdle. It is not movement at the shoulder joint, and I hope you enjoyed that lecture.